Our last lecture focused upon Thucydides and his history of the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides believed that he was writing a possession for all times, a history that would endure forever, and he was correct in that assessment. He was a scientific historian who believed the first task in the writing of history was to get the facts straight, and he pursued the truth. But he also, like Herodotus before him, and like tragedy, believed that the ultimate purpose of any creative work was moral instruction. Herodotus freaks, speaks frequently of hubris. Xerxes lashing the waves of the Hellespont is hubris. Thucydides does not explicitly speak of hubris, but as we saw, in describing the plague that follows upon the celebration of Athens and Pericles' funeral oration, in describing the decision to invade Sicily following upon the Athenian brutal treatment of the Melians, he makes it clear that excessive acts, outrageous arrogance, have disastrous consequences. He was an admirer of Pericles, and he believed that the ultimate defeat of the Athenian democracy lay in its failure to produce leaders of the quality of Pericles in the next generation. And of all those leaders who would most contribute to the ultimate fall of Athens, none was greater both for good and ill, than Alcibiades. He is one of the most fascinating figures in all of Greek history. He was the nephew of Pericles, thus he came from the same great family of the Alcmeonid. He was born in 451. His father, Clinius, was a distinguished Athenian politic politician and statesman. He equipped at his own expense a trireme, a warship, during the Persian Wars, and fought with great valor at the Battle of Artemisium, the naval battle that occurred the same time as Thermopylae. He died fighting in battle for his country, and Alcibiades, his son, was raised by Pericles, and he was given every advantage. The finest sophist of the age taught Alcibiades. He had a superb mind, quick, agile, but also capable of profound thought. He was strikingly handsome. At every time of his life, he was good-looking. He was a cute little baby. He was a darling little boy. In adolescence, he was so beautiful that Phidias thought he should be put in striking display on the sculptures of the Parthenon. And even in middle-aged, he was still extremely handsome. He was willful, spiteful. As a little boy, one day he was fighting with another little boy in the middle of the street and he bit the little boy. And the little boy shouted, Alcibiades, you bite like a girl. And Alcibiades said, no, I bite like a lion. And stories like this show how from an early age he captivated the Athenian people. He became their darling admired by the other little boys. He didn't like playing the flute. In those days, the playing of the flute was one of the essential aspects of the education of a young gentleman. He thought it made him look ugly. So he stopped playing the flute, and all the other little boys in Athens stopped playing the flute. He went to his teacher one day and uh, asked for a book of Homer. The teacher didn't have one, so he grabbed another book and just hit the teacher on the head. Another teacher was explaining to him Homer, and Alcibiades had a pretty good assessment, it seems to me, of teachers and professors, said, you're so smart that you're explaining Homer, why don't you go out and do something that's worthwhile for a living then? So he was willful, and dynamic, and energetic. One time he was lying down in front of the street in order to make a wagon stop just because he could do it. And so he grew up, and at the age of about 18, he became an extremely close friend with Socrates. Now, nobody could be more unalike than these two. Socrates, elderly, pot-bellied, ugly. Alcibiades, handsome and young. 
And yet Socrates saw in Alcibiades gifts and talents. And Alcibiades had the greatest respect for Socrates. When war came with, Ath with Sparta, Socrates served in the Athenian army, and Alcibiades did too. They were on campaign together early in the war. And at one point, Socrates' squadron was cut off, and Alcibiades led a cavalry attack that saved Socrates and the rest of the men and was awarded a medal for his valor. Socrates would go into mystical trances, and on one occasion he went out and sat all alone all through the night on a cold, misty night, and Alcibiades came out and took off his own cloak and wrapped it around Socrates and just sat there with him. He was courted by men and women in Athens. His affairs were constant. On one occasion, a man was deeply in love with Alcibiades and begged Alcibiades to come to his party that night. And Alcibiades refused to come, refused to come. And finally, with a group of his friends, showed up drunk at the party. And they just stood there openly, stealing all the man's silverware. And as they went out the door, someone said to the man, Can't you stop him? He's taking all your silverware. And the man said, Yes, but he's already taken my heart, so let him go with whatever he wants. He married. He married a close relative. And the woman finally became so disgusted by the constant affairs of Alcibiades that she was going to divorce him. And uh, in Athenian law, the wife had to go in person to court to present her request for divorce. And while she was presenting the uh, request to a judge, Alcibiades came in, gave her this passionate kiss, carried her off home, and the next day she sent the word that she didn't want to be divorced anymore, and she stayed with him from then on. He liked to outrage people. And on one occasion, there was this man, again, who was deeply attached to Alcibiades. And the man, who was a foreigner, sold the little estate that he had. And he went and gave the money to Alcibiades. And Alcibiades said, no, I'm not going to take your money, but I'll tell you what we're going to do. It was a, oh, a sum of around, let us say, $300,000. And Alcibiades went with him, and uh, the next day, they were going to auction off the rights to collect taxes. Now what happened in this case was that a, generally a joint stock corporation was formed of individuals. They would pool their resources and bid, let us say, I don't know, $5 million to collect a specific kind of taxes. And then if they collected, say, $7 million, they kept the $2 million as profit. So you really had to have a lot of uh, ready capital to do this. But Alcibiades goes with this little friend and uh, the auction is put up and he says to the man, all right, I want you to bid $7 million man does. The others shout out, he can't afford that. And Alcibiades says, I am his surety. I am the one who stand for his collateral. And then finally Alcibiades made them beg not to do this. He said, all right, you give my friend here a talent. In other words, enough to build a warship, and then I will let it go. One time he had this magnificent dog, huge swooping tail, and Alcibiades cut off the dog's tail. And people said, how could you do that to that beautiful dog? He said, well, people weren't talking enough about me in Athens right now, and I wanted to give them something to talk about. Now, he wondered about his uncle, Pericles, with such ability, such an influence over the Athenian people. Why did his uncle Pericles not make himself dictator? He went one day to talk with his uncle, and the... Uh, the servant said, your uncle is busy right now, but Alcibiades went right in and said, what are you doing? Uncle, and his uncle said, I am preparing my accounts to submit to the Athenian people. You know how, they, how rigorous they are in all financial matters. And he said, you know, uncle, you ought to spend more time figuring out how not to render accounts to the Athenian people. His uncle tried and tried to make him understand that integrity was the key to leadership in a democracy. Alcibiades early on decided he didn't want that key. In fact, he didn't want leadership in a democracy. He wanted absolute rule. He wanted to be dictator of the greatest nation in the world. And the Peace of Nicias signed in 421, when he was about 30 years of age, was a great roadblock to that desire for dictatorship. In peacetime, it is very difficult to rise to the top. But war, 
disasters, calamities. That is what provided the broth to make him an absolute ruler. And so he began to work as hard as he could to undermine this peace of Nicias. It was not very difficult to do. There were many Spartans, as we said in our last lecture, who believed that the peace was dishonorable, that Athens was intent upon absolute domination of the Greek world, of establishing the same kind of tyranny over all of Greece as it did over its empire. And there were many in Corinth and Thebes, strong allies of Sparta, who believed they had gained nothing from the peace. And on the other hand, there was a strong war party in Athens who held true to the vision of Pericles that absolute victory would make Athens supreme, and that must be their goal. Alcibiades lived lavishly. And in fact, during the time of the plague, when the Olympic Games were held, and most Greeks thought that the Athenians could send very few people, that Athens was literally almost finished, Alcibiades went and raced four chariots, the most expensive event, four horse-drawn chariots, and he won the first prize, the second prize, and the fourth prize. He lived lavishly. He had plenty of money to spend on bribes, and he bought himself the position as ambassador to the city of Argos. Argos in the Peloponnese, Argos the inveterate enemy of Sparta, and he managed to bring about an alliance between Athens and Argos and to force a battle between the Spartans and the Argives aided by Athenian troops. This occurred in 418 and effectively broke the peace. The next step was to propel Athens even further down the road to renewed war. And it was Alcibiades who was the leader in the attack upon Milos. Understanding that this act of brutality, killing all the males, selling the women and children into slavery, would lock the Athenians into a blood bond from which there would be no going back. By the time Milos had been destroyed, the conviction was rife in Athens that the war must be renewed. But so equal were the powers of Athens and Sparta that simply renewing the war on its old terms could lead to nothing but another stalemate. What was needed was a massive infusion of strength. The Athenians, led by Alcibiades, and he was a magnificent speaker. He was far better than Pericles. He knew when to be rational. He knew when to be emotional. He could play the Athenians like an instrument. And he convinced them, in assembly after assembly, that Sparta was determined not only to start the war again, but to enlist as their allies the Greek cities of Sicily. Centered upon Syracuse. Syracuse, a city as rich and almost as powerful as Athens. A colony of Corinth, now an independent country, but originally a colony of Corinth. And the same way the Americans have always had special ties to the British. So the Syracusans had special ties of friendship towards Corinth. And Alcibiades convinced the Athenians that Sparta and Corinth were going to make an alliance with Syracuse, and with the naval and military resources of Syracuse, they were going to attack the Athenians, raise up a revolt among the allies of the Athenians, and utterly destroy Athens. Think about it, Athenians. We have destroyed Milos. The Spartans believe that that is our goal for them. So they will certainly want to do it to us. And at this time, there came to Athens in the winter and spring of 415, a delegation from the city of Segesta in Sicily. Segesta was one of the non-Greek cities of Sicily. It believed that it had been founded by Trojans, remnants from the Great War. 
and Sagesta had fallen into conflict with the neighboring Greek city of Salinas. Sicily might be compared to the America of the ancient world. The colonists had gone out there, they had grown rich, they built these great cities, their temples were bigger than anything in the, in the mainland of Greece. Sicily was a great repository of power. And Salinas, like Syracuse, was a Dorian city, favorable to Sparta, but Sicily, at the outbreak of the Great Peloponnesian War, had declared its neutrality. The same way at the outbreak of both the First and Second World Wars, America declared its neutrality. And the Sicilian cities were neutral. But Syracuse and Salinas were favorably disposed towards Sparta. And Segesta was at war with Salinas. And the ambassadors from Segesta went to Athens and said, We ask that you send an expedition to help us. Without your aid, we will be conquered and obliterated. For the goal of Syracuse, acting through its intermediary Salinas, is to conquer the whole of Sicily, and then with this vast power to come to the aid of the Spartans, to sail against you, to bring revolt into your empire, and utterly to wipe you out. Oh, oh Athenian audience listening to this. Sagesta said, if you will come to our aid, we will pay for the entire expedition. However many ships you send, we will pay for. We will pay all the troops that you send. We have with us right now 60 talents as a first installment. And the Athenians very quickly voted to send aid to Sagesta. But then, in the next assembly, they were discussing exactly how much aid should be sent. And they asked one of their most experienced statesmen and generals, Nicias. Nicias, a man of great wealth. Nicias, who had arranged the treaty between Sparta and Athens in 421. Nicias, who was convinced that the Athenians were well out of this war and saw nothing but financial and political ruin in beginning it again. And Nicias, who absolutely despised Alcibiades. For him, Alcibiades was, was all that was wrong with society. He was utterly evil. And Nicias, perhaps alone among the Athenians, understood what Alcibiades wanted, dictatorship. And so Nicias stood up and said, I am glad that you have raised this question of how much we would need to send an expedition to Sicily. I would suggest that we go further and reconsider this whole crazy idea. Have any of you ever looked at a map of Sicily? Do you know how big the island is? It takes eight days to sail around it in a merchant ship. Have you ever visited Sicily and seen the size of a city like Syracuse? Do you know the power that they have? What proof do you have that the Syracusans wish to join up with the Spartans? They have declared their neutrality. They have not sent a single ship or man to aid the Spartans. Moreover, we have just recovered from the plague. We have just gotten out of a war we could not win. Why are you considering this expedition? I will tell you, he is sitting right there, surrounded by his little cronies, in his long robe, with his perfumed hair. It is a young man who will lead you to ruin. He has no goal except to cause chaos in our country and to gain power for himself. Reconsider this expedition. I tell you, we are on the verge of the biggest mistake we will ever make. You tell the suggestions they got into this war with Salinas on their own, they can get out of it on their own. Alcibiades then stood up and said, I would not speak except that I have been personally attacked. Yes, I am in favor of this expedition but only because I am a patriot. I am attacked for 
personal motives. I'll tell you about my personal motives. When our country was thought to be finished at the time of the plague, I sent four chariots to the Olympic Games, and I restored the reputation of Athens. I have served my time in the military, and yet unlike some people, I am not afraid of going to Sicily. Sicily, it is a ragtag place made up of people from all over the Greek world, no real patriotism, overrated. Their cities are overrated. Their military forces are overrated. I tell you, we will go and defeat them, and then, with the power that we have gained, we will not only crush Sparta, but we will conquer Italy. And then on to Carthage. Yes! I'm, shut up, Nicias, just tell us one thing. How many ships do we need? You'll need at least 100 ships. All right, let us pass a decree for 134 warships, 30,000 troops. And so the decree was passed. And for the next weeks, the Athenians were hard at work. Everybody wanted to participate in this expedition. It was going to be a glorious campaign filled with military victory and spoil. And so old men, men in their 40s and 50s, signed up to go, getting new armor for themselves, specially made so the breastplate would come over their pot bellies. Their sons wanted to go with them. Everybody. The finest ships were built, and men competed with themselves to pay for a trireme, which they could then captain. And then, on a May morning, the very height of the preparation for the expeditions. The Athenians came out, started out of their houses, started down the streets, and suddenly stopped and looked. Something strange. All of the little statues of the god Hermes, the messenger god, and there were statues of him at every crossroad, frequently at the entrance to homes, and these herms, as they were called, these statues of Hermes, were four-faced, four-sided, a face of him on each of the four sides. All of these had been mutilated. Someone had broken up the faces. What a sacrilege. What a sacrilege to occur at the very moment that the gods were needed on the side of Athens. And so immediately Nicias and his supporters demanded an inquiry. And the inquiry came up immediately with the name of Alcibiades. Well, he was a pretty wild living character. Servants were brought forward and tortured who described drunken parties at his home in which he, Alcibiades, and his friends would dress up in costumes like the gods and mock the mysteries of Dionysus. He was accused. And he demanded a trial right then and there. I want to clear my name. I will not be a commander of this expedition under these terms. But no. He was not allowed a trial. And the preparations continued. The three commanders had been chosen. Nicias, who begged not to be sent. Alcibiades, who begged to be sent. Why? So Nicias would be a check upon Alcibiades. Much as they loved him, the Athenians were wise enough to be suspicious. And then, to compound the mistake of two commanders, a third was chosen, Lamachus, a trained and capable general. And so the preparations continued, and this cloud of suspicion hanging over Alcibiades. No, first lead the expedition and then come back and we will continue our inquiry. Finally, in June, the expedition was ready. And on that day, down to the harbor at the Piraeus came the whole population of Athens, ambassadors from its allied cities, for allied troops would also sail with the Athenians. The 134 triremes were polished. The armor of the hoplites was polished. The men stood on deck of the ships, waving out to their wives and little children. And then an absolute hush fell over the crowd. 
Never had such an expeditionary force been seen from a Greek city. It was so big, nothing could happen to it. And victory was assured. And then the sacrifices were made. Bulls had their throats cut and the carcasses thrown into the sea as a sacrifice to Poseidon. And the great war trumpets blew. And then the ships began to, to row out, row out of the harbor. And they went out first one behind the other until they reached a broad, open expanse of sea. And then they lined up side by side and raced out to the island of Aegina and sailed off into the setting sun. As they sailed towards Italy, word of their coming was brought to the Syracusans. They had known that this expedition was in preparation, but now it was underway. They tried to rally all of Sicily to a common effort, but most cities preferred just to wait and see. Now Alcibiades had promised the Athenians that they would be welcomed as deliverers by the cities of Sicily and of Italy, except for Syracuse. And the Athenians had counted upon this, counted upon the city of Segesta to give them money, counted upon the cities of Greek Italy to supply them with food and with cavalry. And the first shot came when they arrived in the Greek cities of Italy, all along the southern coast of Italy. And city after city said, Stay back, Athenians. You may not enter our harbors. But we want to trade for food and water. We will not allow you to set up a market. We are strictly neutral in this matter. So they sailed on down to Regium at the very soul of Italy. Still, no city willing to make an alliance with them. And then, at Regium, the shocking news. When they asked Segesta for more money, the Segestans confessed the truth. That 60 talents is all we have, period. What? Yes, we tricked you. But you're here now. What are you going to do? You've got to help us. Yes, but our ambassadors came back from your visiting Segesta, and they said you had, as private individuals, vast amounts of gold and silver. They had never seen so much gold and silver plate, you know, tableware. Uh, yeah, what we did was um, we had one set, and they would eat off of it one night, then we'd move it to the next house, the next house, the next house. I mean, no, nope, 60 talents is as much as we have. And so the question was, what do we do? Nicias said, let us go back home. That's it. Maybe make a show of force at Segesta, but go back home. Lamachus said, a soldier, let us attack immediately Syracuse. But Alcibiades said, no. What we ought to do is sail around, visit the various cities, and make allies. But they don't want to be our allies. I can convince them. Why? because that was his way for reputation and prestige. Only he could make these alliances. And so he refuses to vote with Lamachus, refuses to carry out the strategically correct decision to attack Syracuse, their real enemy. And instead, for weeks and months, the great armada simply sails around in the futile effort to gain allies. Two cities already favorable towards Athens, Nexus, and Catania come over to their side. And then, after one of these futile trips, sailing back into the harbor of their city of Catania, their ally, the Athenians notice a warship, but a warship with a black sail. It is the prison ship sent out by Athens. And as soon as the ship of Alcibiades docks, prisoner keepers come out, wardens, with a warrant. Alcibiades, son of Cleinias, you are hereby called to stand trial for impiety and blasphemy. But that trial was postponed. Yes, 
but it has been put back into effect. You must leave immediately. And they put him in chains. The ship sails up towards the coast of Italy. Money works its purposes. Alcibiades bribes the wardens, slips off the ship, and disappears into the interior of Italy leaving behind this great expeditionary force. And to that expeditionary force in the siege of Syracuse and to Nicias, we will turn in our next lecture.